Hello, welcome to the 19th edition of Drive Through Review. Today we're going to be talking about Sealand. It's uh, from Wolfgang Kramer. Uh, he's done a whole bunch of other games, El Grande, whatever else. And this is a highly interesting family game. It's not really high strategy, it's very medium, about possibly light strategy. And it's just a game that I can't really figure out why I like it. But I do, and my family likes it, and it's very fun. And let me just get into how it works and show you some of the interesting mechanisms that uh, Wolfgang has come up with. So what is Sealand all about? Well, first let's take a lar larger view of the board. You've got basically two areas here. You've got the large uh, marshland and swamp area on this side here. And this is where each player is going to be using their windmills, uh, depicted in these nice little wind meeples to basically sort of gold rush the countryside and, and get as much resources out of it as they can. The other part of the board is this central market area. And the, the gameplay activity is going to take place basically here and here on your turn. You're going to be buying tiles here to place out here and then possibly place one of your windmills out here to try to gather points from the surrounding resources. So let's zoom in to each area and then I'll go through a step by step basically how it works. So in the first part of your turn, you're going to buy one of these tiles that you see here in the middle. Now each player is represented by one pawn. Uh, you can see there's an orange and a brown one there. And what they're going to do is if it's let's say it was orange player's turn, he's going to take the manager pawn here, this black pawn, and he's going to move it clockwise in this fashion to purchase one of these tiles. Now he can move it one space for free so if he wanted this uh, tile here that's uh, two points which is some tulips on it, he could move it over here and, and grab that for free. However, if he wanted to move it a little bit further along the track and maybe grab a little juicier five point tile there, he, thought he would have to move his pawn up the track. So the first tile is free, but then if he had went two more, he'd have to move his orange pawn up two more spaces on these guilders. Now, if he got to the point where he was at the front of the guilders, then he would always be forced to take the next available tile because there's no more spaces for him to move to. Now, when a player has moved off the last guilders here, if there were no players behind this last player, then these two will automatically jump up to the front right there, thus the market kind of rotates as, as this moves along. So if the orange player wanted to purchase this tile, he'd leave that there, grab this tile, and then he would go to place it on the board, but not before replenishing the tile where the manager last was. And then play just continues this way, so as we move along we're replacing tiles. And this is kind of a real interesting way of simulating you know economics without having to deal with actual coins or money or anything because you know you can go so far ahead and, and kind of go into the future to purchase you know a, maybe a more valuable tile but you know the, your currency is the amount of these guilders that are left available for you to move forward and you have to kind of see where you know this last player may he may just camp back there and force you to you know stay up front and then maybe be forced to take something you don't particularly want. Now these coins here are uh, every player starts with one coin and once per turn you can turn one of these in to immediately take a second turn. So if you see you got yourself a nice little uh, combo set up here where maybe you can move up take this three-point windmill and then immediately on your next turn turn your coin in and then grab that four-point uh, tile for free. So there's two types of tiles that are going to be out here. There's going to be windmills here, like that, so that's a three-point windmill. And then there's going to be one of three kinds of crops. There's going to be tulips here, and these cabbages here, and then these yellow ones are called wrap seeds. So you're either going to be able to grab one of these kind of crops here, or a windmill. And then as soon as you grab that, you're going to, be, you're going to grab it, purchase it, and then go try to place it on the board over here somewhere. Okay, so once you purchase a tile, if it's a crop tile like this wrap seed here or one of the cabbage or whatever, you're going to want to place it next to one of your 
windmills here. So you've got four windmills, and to start the game, everybody gets a chance to put a windmill on one of these starting areas here. So you're going to grow out from the central area to try to, you know, sort of dominate the land, so to speak. So if you purchase one of these uh, crops, you have to place it next to one of your windmills if you've got one out there. So what, why would you place it next to your windmill? What you're going to do here is put these tiles surrounding your windmill. And as soon as he's surrounded, you're going to score that. And how that you score that is you're going to score the points that are on the windmill space here. So in this case, five. And then each surrounding crop tile. You're not going to score any surrounding windmill tiles, just the surrounding crop tiles. So in this case, I would get 5, 10, 15, 19 points. But there's a little twist to the scoring. If you have one of each type of crop surrounding your windmill, you're going to get a 5-point bonus. So it would be 5, 10, 15, 20, 24 points. So that's nice. However, there's another drawback to that. If I have all of the same color surrounding my windmill, I will get zero points. I don't get any points for that at all. So you're really trying to go for a diverse selection of your crops. So let's say this is, I've just scored this here. So I will get my windmill back. I've already scored that. So now I don't have any windmills out there. Well, what, what will I want to do? Well, if you look back over to the marketplace, you can see that I want to purchase one of these windmills. So if I can move up here, grab that, and remember I skipped the first space. The first space is free, but the next space is going to have to make me move. So he'll have to move up on the guilders a little bit. So he'll take this windmill here. Let's move back over here. And you can see that this is a three-point windmill. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this out here on the board. And when I do that, I have the option. I don't always have to do this, but I have the option of putting a new windmill back there. Okay. So now you can see this guy's actually already surrounded. So I've got already got a yellow and a red here. So all I need now is a green on one of these spots to give me that diversity bonus like I spoke of earlier. There's one other aspect though. Of when you place a windmill and you touch one of these tiles here, you can see this board is fill full of these little island tiles that are face down. If you ever place a windmill that's touching one of these island tiles, you will immediately flip these up. So you'll flip this one up, so that's another five point tulip. And this one here is a zero point farm. But what a farm will give you is it'll give you one of these coins back. And like I said before, these are for taking another immediate turn. So it's good to find those. It's going to give you zero points for when you score your windmill, but it's very nice to have these. So there's basically three types of tiles that are going to be flipped up. There's going to be a, it could be a farm tile, like I said. It could be one of these uh, crop tiles, or it could be a very special type of crop tile. If you look at this tile here, you can see above the five there, there's a little pawn, a depiction of a pawn there. What that is, is that's a governor. And so you're going to go over here to the little governor pile, take one of those, and then put that next to the windmill. Now what this does is it puts sort of a responsibility on this player to score a certain number of points with that windmill. If we look back over here on this thing here, so you can see here's the guilders here that are, are always going to be kind of slowly moving around this circle here. As the players move up and then these guilders get moved up here, it's going to cover up and reveal these tiles. And you can see these tiles here have a number. This is a 22, a 17, 23, blah, blah, blah. And so this is going to be changing as well. And what's so special about this is that any uh, windmill that's going to score with a governor has to score more than this number of points. So right now it's 22. So if we go back and look at our friend, the orange player over here, right now he's in pretty good shape. He's got 5, 10, 15, 18 points. He only needs four more points, so that's two more tiles there. And if he gets a diversity, so if he gets a cabbage pot, pot, uh, tile there, he's going to get the plus five anyway, so he's in good shape. If he scores 22 or higher, he's going to get an extra five points on top of that. And he's going to get 
this governor in his possession, he's going to put that right in front of him. And at the end of the game, whoever has the most governors is going to get a bonus in points. However, if he doesn't score the minimum amount, this uh, governor will get transferred to the nearest uh, other player, and he'll have to then try to score that. So when you sco go to score your windmill, you have these two tokens here. And so what these mean is that twice per game, you can sort of like place a bet if you think that was going to be your highest or possibly second highest scoring of the game. So each time you score, you're going to move these little pawns up the track here. Okay? And these are just going to keep going around and around. So you might score 20 points and he's going to shoot way up this track here and he may score 25 points, he's going to shoot way up the track. But let's say I just scored 25 points and I'm the brown player. I'm going to put this little marker down here and I'm going to say, okay. You know, and I think that's probably going to be my best score of the game. But you may come along on a later turn and holy cow, you scored 31 points on that. So you say, well, I'm going to put that there. And the orange player may come along and he may say, he might get 30 points and say, oh, I'm going to put that there. So that was a pretty good score on that, on that harvest. But, oh, he may come up here and get 33 on that side. So let's say that was the end game configuration there where orange had the highest single scoring followed by brown and then orange and then brown again. Well, at the end of the game, orange is going to get 20 points for having the highest single score during a harvest. And brown will get 15, orange will get another 10, and then brown will get 5. So the first, second, third, and fourth place single harvest scoring is going to get those bonus points. So that makes a fun little aspect where you know, you're know you kind of saying, okay, I think I did pretty good. And it takes sort of repeated plays to figure um, you know, what is a good score for a single harvest. And just let you know it's right around this area. <laughs> so it's actually a pretty simple game. You're going to buy a tile. You're going to find a good spot to place it. And then, you know, you're going to try, if you surround your windmill, you're going to score the harvest. And then, you know, go to the next player. Uh, now, this is a little bit random, obviously, with these face-down tiles here. However, this board is actually pretty cool. It comes apart in pieces like that, very modular. On the other side of the board is a fixed layout. So instead of placing these tiles face down on their island side, you just place them face up. And the same rules for placement apply. It's like if you make contact with this tile, which has a governor with a windmill there, you're going to just take the governor and put it there. But everybody's going to know where the governors are at. And so they can sort of tactically um, and even strategically pick a path to where they're going to go and if I connect to this tile here then he all of a sudden becomes the end of the developed area and then somebody can immediately place a tile there and you can really see where you might unlock a potential path for an opponent but I definitely recommend playing with the the random side of the board the first time just so everybody kind of gets the idea and the flow of the game and then you can switch to the tactical side and and then really have some fun strategic noodling on that side. Well, I hope you enjoy the overview. Uh, as you can tell, the components are pretty spectacular uh, for this kind of family game. Um, you know, this is a really fun game. It, it's sort of like if you played Samurai, it's sort of like Samurai in reverse. Uh, if, if you played Samurai, I think you'll understand what I mean. Um, you know, there's a lot of good interaction in a three and four player game where you're kind of competing for area and you know putting your windmills in proximity to other players and trying to you know steal some of the better locations and the better tiles um, but even in the two player there's still a lot of strategy in the marketplace and figuring out you know when to use those coins to maybe you know set up a nice real good combo rific turn or even to set your opponent up to sort of have a less than desirable opportunity to grab you know some good tiles and the rules are actually designed in such a way so that you can play you know just the basic random game 
without any governors or the betting or you know anything like that and then you can so you could play that with kids if you wanted to and then you can kind of sort of add these rules as you go and then once you know everybody's real you know comfortable with the game you can switch to that tactical side where you know there's a little bit more strategic you know thought and planning that can happen anyway it's a game that uh you know it's really under the radar i have no idea why it's fun it's a good family game it's by wolfgang kramer what gives uh, anyway, uh, thanks.